Christ is risen. He is riven, risen indeed. Welcome to our service in Moreau Presbyterian Church. To those who are able to meet here together face to face in the meeting house, and of course to everyone watching and listening over in the hall, we are delighted that you can join with us. It is so good to see so many of our young people here with us today. We have missed seeing you all, and we are glad that you have come out to church this morning. Thank you for your cooperation on entering the church building this morning. Thank you also for wearing a face covering during the service, and we want everyone to be safe and as comfortable as is possible. We will remain seated throughout our service and would remind you to remain in your seat at the close of worship until you are asked to leave by one of the stewards. Thank you for your cooperation in this matter. The weather outside has remained dry. Please do take a moment this Easter Sunday morning to greet each other in the car park. We are all so excited to see each other again. Please do remember to keep socially distanced. We want to extend a special welcome to all those who are listening to your online service today. We pray that you will know God's blessing as you listen in at home. Please continue to pray for our minister, the Reverend Jones, during this period of recovery. We pray that he and Elspeth will be very aware of God's presence as they continue in this journey. Anyone requiring the services of a minister in the event of an emergency should contact me. We want to extend a very warm Maru welcome to the Reverend Dr. Ian McNee. We are delighted to welcome you back to our pulpit this morning. The last time you were here, it was to record the service. It is good to meet you, meet with you in person today. We look forward to hearing what God has laid upon your heart to share with us today. Thank you. Well, I would like to say a word of thanks to Richard for the welcome afforded to me this morning. It's lovely to be here, and I'm sure most of you, like myself, are glad that the restrictions have been lifted to the extent that we're able to come back and to worship together in church. And so it's very good and encouraging to see so many here, uh, not only in the church building, but as I understand uh, those of you who are in the hall. I'm sorry we're not able to, to meet face to face, but however, uh, it's good. It's a step forward uh, in the road to, to getting back uh, to, to church services again. So thank you very much for the invitation, and we do trust that uh, your minister, uh, Mr. Jones, may soon uh, be recovered and back with you again. Yes, this is Easter Sunday, as we've been reminded, and the hymns that have been chosen for today are, are very much in keeping uh, with the Easter theme. And I was just remarking uh, to the uh, person who gave me the, the, the hymns that those were the, the hymns that were chosen for this morning are this, exactly the same hymns that I would have chosen on Easter Sunday uh, before I retired in my home congregation of uh, Trinity and Balamoni. So we're going to begin our service of worship as we join together in the words of the hymn, Thine Be the Glory.
Now let's unite together in prayer. Lord our God, we thank you that on this Easter Sunday morning we can gather together here in worship. We thank you for our health and strength that enables us to be here. We thank you for the physical provisions of life that you give to us each day, our food and clothing, our family and friends. But we come particularly today and we thank you for the opportunity of gathering together in worship. We come today and we want to remember the birth and the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ. We want to remember the fact that he set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing that that would be the end of his earthly life. And so we come and we rehearse in our minds those events of the last week of Jesus Christ's life. We recognize that he went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. We recognize that he was arrested, he was tried by a prejudiced jury, he was convicted by a cowardly judge, and he was sentenced to death by crucifixion on the cross. But as we come today, we are reminded of that great historical event of the past, that on the third day he rose again from the dead, and that he is alive in our world today, and he seeks to enter into the lives of men and women and young people and change those lives. We recognize that on the cross he died, that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we at last might go to heaven, saved by his precious blood. We realize too that on the cross he accomplished pardon for our past, leading to peace in the present and hope for the future. And so, our Father, as we come to sing your praise this morning, may the words we sing be a meaningful expression of our love and our gratitude to you, that as we read your word, may your Holy Spirit speak to us from its pages, that as we pray that we may pray unitedly for those things that you lay upon our hearts, and grant our Father that at the end of the day we might know that it was good for us to have been here, because here we met with you. Father, we do come today, and we recognize that all of us have sinned, we sin in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. We say things that ought not to cross our lips. We are engaged in actions that should never be performed as those who claim to be your children. May we come confessing our sin and claiming the promise of your word that when we confess that you're able and willing to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, our Father, we pray that you'll be with us throughout the remaining part of this service today and grant that we might know a sense of your presence as your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and beginning to read at the 13th verse. The first 12 verses of the chapter reminds us of the fact that the woman went to the tomb and discovered that Jesus was no longer there. And they communicated that information to other people. And we take up the story uh, in chapter 24, verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. They as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, and they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and do you not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of his companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things, then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them 
what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which he was going, Jesus acted as if he would go further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. And we know that God's blessing will follow the reading of his word. When I, uh, when I was over in the minister's room and I was uh, glancing out the window on occasions, I saw a number of boys and girls, and probably most of you must be over in the hall, uh, and some of you, I know, are in the church building here. But I want to tell you a story this morning, and uh, it's, it's really, it will eventually come to, to the Easter story. Uh, but it's, uh, it will finish by, by speaking about Jesus Christ rising from the dead. But it's a story about a wee boy. Now, he didn't live in my row, but he lived on a farm. Uh, and uh, the farm actually was in Scotland. And uh, he had to move house because, um, well, as far as his dad was concerned, he, he, he wanted to, to move into the big city of Glasgow. It was a strange thing for a farmer to do, but that's what he decided to do, and he moved into Glasgow. And he moved into a wee house where there were many streets and they were all the same. And the wee boy didn't really appreciate or did he enjoy this new situation. He liked the open spaces of the farm, but however, in the new situation, he had to settle in. He, he went to school, and when he would come home from school, he, uh, well, he, he, he didn't uh, go out very much until his mother told him that uh, it was good for him to get out and play with the other boys. And so he went out and he kicked football in the streets and he, he kicked football for uh, quite a, a while. And it was uh, during the winter months when it was dark quite early in the evenings. And suddenly uh, one of the boys said, right, it's time for us to go home. And they lifted the ball and they went home. And uh, they left him just standing there. And as they'd been kicking football, they'd been moving from one street to another. And uh, all the streets looked the same, and as I say, it was dark. And suddenly the wee boy realized that, my goodness, I really don't know where I am, and I don't know how to get home. And so he got a bit anxious, and he sat down at the side of the footpath, and he, well, he started to cry. And as he was sitting there, suddenly he heard footsteps. And he didn't know what these footsteps were, but they stopped just right beside him. And as he looked up, he discovered that there was a policeman standing beside him. The policeman looked at him and he said to him, well, what's wrong? And the wee boy said, well, I'm, I'm lost. And where do you live? He said, I can't remember what my address is. Well, is there anything in the street that, that would help us understand uh, what the situation is and where you might live? No, he said, I don't, I can't think, I can't think of anything. And the policeman said, but is there, is there a lorry parked in the street or uh, is, is there anything on the street that you could help me to help you understand where you live? Then the wee boy turned and he said, look, I, 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 if you could take me to the cross. The policeman thought for a minute, what, what is the cross? He thought a long time for a minute, and then suddenly he realized at the end of one of the streets there was, there was one of these big stone crosses. And uh, he thought, well, we'll take him to, the, to this cross. It was called a, a war memorial. And he took him by the hand, and they eventually arrived at the cross. When they, they got to the cross, the wee boy pointed down one of the streets and he said, that's where I live. And 
He said, now that I have found the cross, I can find my way home. And you know, boys and girls, uh, at this time of the year, we think about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And he came into the world for a particular purpose. And if we read our Bibles, we know that Jesus did many wonderful things. He healed people. He was able to perform miracles. He was able to do all sorts of things that would give good advice to people, his teaching that he gave and so on. It was really very good. And he was interested in boys and girls as well as men and women too. But at the end of his life, as we have been thinking about over the past number of days, Jesus Christ was taken and he was crucified on the cross. And the reason for that was that he went to the cross in order that we might have our sins forgiven. Now, you might say, well, what, what, what is a sin? Well, sometimes you don't do what mommy and daddy tell you to do. Maybe sometimes you're a bit selfish and you're maybe at school or even at home and you, you don't share what you have with other people. Maybe sometimes you tell maybe a lie to get yourself out of some problem that you've found yourself in. Those are all things that the Bible calls sin. But Jesus died on the cross that we might have our sins forgiven. But had Jesus just died and uh, lay in the grave, uh, well, that wouldn't have been all that much good for us. But look, here's what happened. And this is what we celebrate on uh, Easter mon morning that Jesus rose from the dead. It meant that Jesus was different from everybody else. He was God's son, and therefore on the cross he was able to do what he claimed that he would do, that he would be able to forgive us our sins, that if we trust him as our saviour, then he will be with us. He will help us uh, in life, in all the things that we do. And if we read our Bible and follow what it teaches, if we pray and ask for his help, he will do that. Uh, because he's alive in heaven and one day we will go to be with him uh, ourselves when we are God's children. And so you remember the story about the wee boy uh, who got lost, but he found his way home when he went to the cross and how the cross is so important for us to understand its meaning today. Now we're going to sing uh, the piece, Jesus Christ is alive today. And let us again unite together in prayer. Oh Lord our God, we come today and we give you thanks that you have given to us the ministry of intercession, whereby we can come and pray for others. This time we come and we remember Jeff. We thank you for his ministry here, and we pray your continuing blessing upon him, and that soon he may recover and be able to gather in worship with the congregation. 
We pray for Elspeth, his wife, and the family. And may they all know your help and encouragement at this time. Remember also the leadership within the church here. We pray for members of session and committee and for all those who are engaged in different aspects of church life. We thank you for those who are involved in the music side of life here, for the praise group as they lead in worship, for those who are involved in the technology, and for all who help in different ways to enable the services to be broadcast not only uh, on a Sunday here, but over the web on different occasions. We, we thank you for all that has been accomplished there in the past. Remember the elderly within the congregation, for those who are maybe anxious about their own health, for those who are sick, for possibly some who may be in hospital, or for those who are waiting operations, or for those who are recovering from operations. We pray your blessing and your help. Remember those who may in the congregation have been bereaved over the past days. May they know comfort and strength and support and encouragement from their family, their friends, and from the fellowship here. We come to you and we remember the wider church to which we belong, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. We think of the moderator at this time and the difficult task that he has of not being able to go around the church as he would have enjoyed. We pray for the clerk of the General Assembly, the principal of our college, and for all those who are engaged in different aspects of the life and work of our church. Remember the international meeting point in the Lisburn Road in Belfast, seeking to assist and help asylum seekers and refugees. We recognize that their work has been greatly disadvantaged over these past uh, months, but we pray that you'll be with those who are in the leadership here. We think too of the National Health Service. We remember doctors and nurses, ancillary workers, and all those who have helped and given of their lives so unsparingly over the days that have passed. We pray that you will continue to be with them and keep them safe and well. We pray too for all those who have contributed to life and helped uh, us all, and those who have been at the forefront of, of all the work that has been going on, and those who have put themselves at risk and at disadvantage as they have done their daily work in order to keep life going on. And so we give you thanks for them. Remember too our government. We ask that you'll be with the parliament both in Westminster and in Stormont and grant our father that they too may be given a wisdom beyond themselves and as a result of the decisions that they take that it may be for the good and the welfare of all the citizens of our land. And so we pray that you'll continue to be with us now and as we turn in a moment to your word we pray that your Holy Spirit may guide and and encourage us in our thoughts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now the praise group are going to sing the peace, O oh, to see the dawn.
Again, on all our behalf, I'd like to say a word of thanks to uh, James and the praise group for uh, leading us so effectively this morning in our praise. It always enhances the service when the music is good, and we want to say a special word of thanks to them uh, for that. As I was sitting there, I was just trying to remember when I had last taken a service here when uh, the, the congregation were face to face with me, and I can remember very vividly uh, the evening it was... Uh, uh, a PWA anniversary service, and my son uh, was uh, in our house having tea with us before we came that particular night. And he said, where are you going, Dad, tonight? I said, I'm going to take a PWA service. And he said, you know, you used to be asked to go and take youth services all the time. Now you're taking PWA services. It says something about your age. Uh, <laughs> but uh, however, uh, it's lovely to be here, and it was lovely to be there on that particular occasion. A number of years ago, there was a man called Hugh Sconfield, and he wrote a book, uh, and he was a critic of Christianity, and his intention was to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he took the view that when Jesus was taken down from the cross, when he was sealed in the tomb, that the breeze of the evening air as it blew through the cracks in the rocks revived him, and he was able in some manner to to struggle out again. And his disciples then, on the basis of that particular incident, claimed that he had risen from the dead. Those who analysed what he had said came very quickly to the conclusion that he obviously didn't himself analyse the deadly character of the wounds that he was inflicted upon Jesus on the cross. He completely forgot about the careful examination that would have been given by, to Jesus by the Roman soldiers who were experienced in execution and they would have made sure that he was dead before he was taken down from the cross. They didn't take into account the constricting grave clothes that would have been around him that would have not enabled him to free himself even had he been alive. And they didn't take into account the massive stone that was across the uh, entrance to the grave. Sometime later, another man who was a skeptic of Christianity called Frank Morrison sought to write a book and to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was a trained lawyer, and he wrote a book entitled Who Moved the Stone? And eventually, when the book was published, to the surprise of his friends, the first uh, chapter of the book was entitled The Book That Refused to Be Written. That as Frank Morrison looked at the evidence of the resurrection, he said that he had only come to the conclusion that the biblical analysis of what had happened was completely accurate, and he became a convinced Christian. As we gather this morning to celebrate the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want us for a few minutes today to look at the impact that the resurrection had upon different individuals. And we read this morning from Luke chapter 24, and the first people I want us to, to look at are the two friends who were traveling on the road to Emmaus, and for them, the resurrection brought new hope. They were totally helpless and hopeless as far as they were concerned. For them, their friend, their advisor, their mentor had been taken cruelly from them and they had been put to death. And as far as they were concerned, Jesus Christ had promised that he was coming to establish a kingdom. And they no doubt thought that they would have some special responsibilities in this kingdom. But now he had been taken and he had been crucified on the cross and he had been put into the tomb and their aspirations were totally and completely shattered. The report they received then from the woman didn't help them in, much, uh, in, in any way because they, when they visited the tomb, they discovered that the body wasn't there and that led to their anxiety and their grief. And now there was a stranger who had joined them and he didn't seem to know what was going on and they expected that everybody in the area would have known the story of Jesus at that particular time. But as we read this morning, as the story unfolded, you remember what happened. The tragedy of their lives turned to triumph. Their defeat became victory and their despondency became joy as they realized that the one whose company they were in was Jesus Christ. And the resurrection for them brought new hope. Today at times, isn't it so true to say that we can be overwhelmed with problems 
and difficulties and anxieties, might be problems associated with personal health, maybe the health of, of some loved one that we have. It may be a problem, uh, as has been the case with so many over the past year with loneliness or mental health issues. It could be a problem with um, unemployment, perspective redundancy, having been furloughed, are we going to be taken back again? Maybe problems associated with the fallout of all this, monetary problems, or there could be earlier problems of fractured relationships within our families or within its, our, our work or with our neighbours or with other people. And in the midst of any or all of these problems, we appear at times not to have much hope. But we're reminded in the scriptures and we're reminded as far as Jesus is concerned what he said to those who loved him. Come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you encouragement. I will give you hope. And so many people down through the centuries have found that when their backs were against the wall, when things were at a crisis point within their lives, that they turned to Jesus Christ and they found a completely new dimension of life. And they began to understand what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? Where am I going? How am I going to get there? Answers to the questions of life that so often others are unable to answer. But yet, isn't it true to say too, that there are often there are people and they hide behind the mask of an apparent contentment of material prosperity, of social acceptability, even of religious practice. And as a result of that, they miss out because at the end of the day, they suffer from what we might even call a spiritual bankruptcy. The two friends, through their encounter with Jesus Christ, clearly had a new hope and that was something that each of us can experience when we trust Jesus Christ as well as our Lord and Savior. But then secondly, there were not only the two friends on the road to Emmaus, but there was Peter. And for the resurrection, or in the resurrection, what did that bring for Peter? It brought undoubtedly a new courage. When Jesus was arrested, you remember, Peter went to bits. He, like the other disciples, expected that Jesus was going to establish some kingdom, but it wasn't going to happen. And on the first Good Friday when he was present, he would have experienced all that was going on on that particular day, that abruptly and dramatically, about the sixth hour, God took center stage and the darkness fell over the land to the ninth hour. And as someone once put it, that during that particular time, God brought the outer darkness of hell into Jerusalem as he unleashed his judgment and his wrath and his fury upon his son. And at that particular moment when that happened, as it were, what was happening? We see that Jesus was absorbing the collective punishment of all who would believe. And as when he called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was inflicting upon Jesus Christ both the punishment that was deserving for others and also he was inflicting an absence of his comfort from his son. And no doubt Peter realized what was happening and he felt shame and remorse because he would have felt that he was complicit with some of the things that had been happening by his denial of Jesus. But note what happened on the morning of the resurrection. When the angel spoke to the woman who went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, the angel said, go and tell his disciples and Peter. Peter was singled out for special mention. And if we might fast track Peter's life, uh, a few weeks later, until the day of Pentecost, what do we see there? Do we see a man who is hopeless? No, we see a man who is courageous, with enthusiasm, with clarity, with confidence. Uh, he was on the streets of Jerusalem, and he was confronting the religious authorities of the day because he believed that they were complicit in all that had happened as far as Jesus was concerned. He'd got a new courage 
And because Jesus Christ was, as it were, alive, and his teaching was clear in the heart and mind of Peter, he recognized that he had to stand up for Jesus because of all that had happened in the past and because of how that he had been given that very special uh, forgiveness as far as he was concerned. Not only was he forgiven by Jesus before he returned to heaven, but here Peter was the cornerstone of the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost. And I think it's true to say that today as never before, Christians need to exhibit a courage and stand up for what is right within the secular society in which we are living. The gospel today has and is and always will be a challenge to the world with its own personal ideologies and emphasis and presuppositions and priorities. It is a challenge to the prevailing culture of today, the culture that basically says, I can live as I like, I can do my own thing, I can cultivate my own beliefs, I can claim my own rights, I can determine what is my truth, and as far as I'm concerned, there are no absolutes, there is no ultimate authority, there's no, uh, not, nothing as far as personal uh, and corporate responsibility, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, a modern day classic of this was the interview of Meghan and Harry uh, not so long ago when Meghan claimed that she was married three days before the actual marriage took place. And uh, anybody would have known, uh, if they knew anything about law, that two witnesses must be present at a wedding. Anybody would have known that in most cases there is a, a rehearsal before a wedding, and I'm sure that's what the Archbishop was doing on that particular day. But as far as she was concerned, she had a truth that she wanted to communicate. And that was her truth. But it wasn't the truth. And very often today, the mentality in our world is whatever I think is right. I have long passed uh, the position that I believe that uh, what I think is necessarily right, that my opinions are necessarily right. Because so often I have an opinion and somebody else has an opinion which is completely opposite. Both of us think we're right. And who is right? We can't both be right. And surely the answer to that question, especially with regard to spiritual things, is what does the Bible say? What's the Bible truth of the matter? And when we look at it from that point of view, then we can come to the conclusion that if we are in keeping with what the Bible is teaching, then we're right. Otherwise, we cannot claim to be right. But we need to stand up for the truth of the gospel at this particular time. So there was the two friends. They were, had new hope. There was Peter who had new courage. And then finally, there was Saul of Tarsus. And for him, what was the outcome of the resurrection? There was new life. Here was a man who would have shared the views of those who orchestrated the death of Jesus Christ. Later on, he would have no doubt acquiesced and did acquiesce with those who were stoning the first Christian martyr by the name of Stephen. And he was well aware of the great advance of the growth of the church after the day of Pentecost. And as a result of that, he was passionately uh, committed to eradicate the influence of the church from the Roman Empire at that particular time. And we all know the story of him traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus. And on the Damascus Road, he was confronted by what he later called the risen Christ. And his experience on that particular occasion changed his life as he exhibited what so often has been referred to as the new birth. He recognized that his greatest need was not to cling to what he had previously believed. He wasn't to cling to his social background, his religious background, but what was Jesus Christ meaning for him as he was confronted by him on the road that day? And we discover that what happened was that he 
became the recipient of what so often has been referred to as the new birth, as a man of high intellectual character and caliber. He realized that Jesus Christ was alive and he realized that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Paul realized that he needed to experience the new birth. And what is the new birth? It's not just simply a turning over of a new leaf. It's not just simply making a New Year's resolution. It's not having a new start or having a greater understanding of Bible truth. But surely it is the supernatural work of God in your heart and in mine, enabling us to exercise saving faith as we understand the sentiment of the hymn, Rock of Ages, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And we need to ask ourselves, do we have that confidence that Saul of Tarsus had when he became the great apostle Paul, when he said that I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor anything in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The world in which you and I live surely has been changed dramatically as a result of the pandemic that we're just hopefully coming out of. And many of the things that people considered in the past to be of great significance and of absolute necessity in their lives have been swept away. And people have understood more than ever before the fragility of life. And many people have realized that those things in life that they considered to be important are of little consequence any longer. I wonder, could it be that in the future we say that the world has changed? Yes, the world has changed and will change and continue to change. And also, in some respects, will the church. I think the church will go through a period where there will be those who have been fringe to the church may continue to be fringe. But those who are committed should therefore be redoubling their efforts and recognizing what is the true meaning and the purpose of the gospel. What is the church in existence for? It's not just simply a social club. It's not just simply somewhere where we've always come on a Sunday morning. But the church is the living body of Christ on earth, called to fulfill the commission that he gave to his disciples prior to his return to heaven after his resurrection, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to see people born again by the Spirit of God, giving them a new hope, a fresh courage, and a new life. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we come this morning and we want to give you thanks for all your goodness to us. We thank you for bringing us safely through the months that have passed. We thank you for the opportunity of worshipping together today and we pray that as the days and weeks and years go on that we will not have to go back to a lockdown situation, that we will be able to come and worship together, have fellowship the one with the other and help us as we do so to recognize that Jesus Christ died, that he rose from the dead, and that he can live in each of our lives, giving us true meaning and purpose in life, giving us a hope for the future, a courage in the present, and also a new life for all eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We conclude our service as we join together in the words of that uh, modern uh, Easter hymn that has so much meaning and depth within its words. See what a morning gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. <laughs>
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with each of us now and until Jesus calls or until he comes, and then forevermore. Amen.